Good morning, everybody. Should I do the Ricola again? <laughs> I'll spare you. <laughs> Good morning. I hope everyone had a great time last night at Oktoberfest and experiencing Mount Angel. It's wonderful. Some of us experienced it more than others. <laughs> um, I'm Lorna Davis. I'm the Global Sales Manager at Travel Oregon. And I'm really excited to be here with you today, especially after last night. Um, as many of you already know, Miles Partnership is a longtime strategic partner of Travel Oregon. Miles Partnership is Brand USA's marketing partner and the country's leading destination marketing company. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our friend and all of your friend, John DeLiva from Miles Partnership. You know, I'm, I'm lucky to be uh, living in Washington half every year because uh, I'm Oregon's neighbor and that allows me to have some very magic Oregon moments every year. Last year, though, two very interesting incidents happened, Oregon moments, elsewhere. One in British Columbia, which gave me a new respect of Oregonians and how they defend their state and one in Washington State, which gave me a terrible fear of Oregon wine. I'll explain both. So I'm up in BC, and I'm wearing a t-shirt that Petra had given me years ago. It's your old branding. It says, just Oregon, no big deal. And you'd think wearing a shirt like that is no big deal. But apparently to three different sets of Oregonians, it was. I got challenged. One person came up to me in a line and just said, is that some kind of California thing putting us down? <laughs> Best case though, it was a couple. And I was in Stanley Park. I was just sitting on a bench, just taking a break. I think I was returning some texts. And uh, she came up to me and just pointed right at my chest and said, that's not very nice. And I looked at her and said, oh no, no, it's just, it's a, a tourism slogan that Travel Oregon uses, it's just a way that, to say they're humble. They know they got a lot there, but they're pretty modest people. That's still not very nice. Anyway, she was a wonderful woman from Cresswell. We talked for a long time. Ultimately, she wanted to take a picture with me so she can show that shirt to her friends. Waves her husband over, he comes over and takes the picture, shakes my hand and says, whatever my wife says, I agree. So it's, it's nice to see the defense of your state. Second incident, wow, this was crazy. My wife and I opened a wine shop a couple hours north of here in a little town of Union, Washington. When we first did it, we built these racks of wine. They're three deep, they're 24 down, seven across, 504 bottles. It's somewhat of an intimidating display for exactly one reason. A lot of people come up, they look, we have it labeled, they want wine from a particular state or a particular country, and then they find it. But not everyone could see our little tabs. So they asked if I can go put signs above that would identify them. This is when I took the Oregon plate and stood on a step ladder and went to put it on top of the Oregon rack. My left arm hit a bottle, which then hit another bottle, which then hit the middle row. And all in all, one of the most frightening, loudest incidents I've been around, 55 bottles of wine crashed. The silver lining was threefold. One, I have a wife smart enough to insist we had cork floors. Only six of those bottles broke. Number two, I had some people next door who heard it happen in the retail shop and they came and actually cleaned it up because they felt sorry for me. And then number three, I'm happy to say our number one selling Pinot by far is from the Willamette Valley. So uh, there, there's a lot of... All right, I know I got to get off here because we got some great speakers, but I want to introduce a couple people. I'm John with the Miles Brand USA team, and today we have Jared Fuchs, who's with the Brand USA team. God, stand up for a sec. He's from, he's from Houston, Texas, but he loves Oregon and is going to get to know it better. Also knows college sports very well if you want to have a conversation. This, this guy knows his stuff. Um, Natalie was here from our Tourism Exchange USA team. I know she had to head back to Seattle. Uh, that's something that the Tourism Exchange, which is allowing a lot of people out there with uh, tourism products, Travel Oregon is going to be involved in this program. Brand USA is 
I'm going to let uh, Greg, Petra, Gabi, your staff tell you more when it all becomes official, but we're working on that one right now. And then also, I think Rebecca, are you out there somewhere? Rebecca is here from our destination optimization team. A lot of the DMOs, you've worked with her. Her role is to help you to get everything so Google and other social out there are accurate with your information. Uh, I've actually used that program for my own business, and it's truly a way for anybody operating to make sure people are getting the accurate info on you. So, Rebecca, are you out there? Like, all right, perfect, there we go. Well, uh, thank you for, I mean, it's, I love everything we've done for a long time with Travel Oregon. I love the people here. I love being here. Just thank you for allowing us to be part of it, and um, we'll go onward with the next. I heard that. Thank you, John. I want to say a couple things about John that um, I was remiss in saying before. Um, little known facts about John. He um, has a favorite hangout spot in Oregon, and that happens to be wherever brew pub or record store that Eckhart takes him to. <laughs> um, he's been with Miles 12 years and started doing work in the travel industry some 38 years ago, having his first travel article published in a newspaper, and he said, and he got paid for it. And his first cross country trip, which was 55 years ago, he, has, um, he is the youngest American to visit all 3,086 counties, boroughs, and parishes in the USA. And he might have been banned from a rental car company for the abuse of the unlimited miles. <laughs> and he's secretly a fan of flying. And he said, even more so, I'm secretly a, a fan of never going home. So John, thank you for not being home and being here with us today. It's such a privilege to introduce and acknowledge a longtime port partner of ours and a friend. The Port of Portland is much more than an award-winning airport. The port is the gem in the crown of the 23 Oregon ports. They are a profound contributor to the economic well-being of Oregon, whether it be recreation, commercial, industrial, Cargo, the port's economic services expand and contribute to jobs, not only in Oregon, but globally. In fact, one in six family wage jobs are attributed to our ports in Oregon. Our beloved PDX not only rocks the best carpet, but it has the best people working for it. And they play a crucial role in attracting airlines, which drives revenue, passenger numbers, which are our visitors, regional economic growth. Their role in fostering relationships, negotiating contracts, help optimize those very routes that feed our tourism economy. I'd like to tell you a little about our friend David Zelke, who is the director of air operations at the Port of Portland. He is not only a stellar Chicago fan, he's been to 30 concerts and counting, he um, happens to love the Packers, and he recently admitted that he's secretly an American Idol fan. Um, he also has some favorite places in Oregon, which include Cannon Beach and Black Butte, where he loves to ride his bike on the trails. David has just completed his 19th year with the Port of Portland and is working on his 20th, and he'll rock it. Please help me welcoming in our friend David Zelke. So how excited are we that Lauren's back with Travel Oregon? Aren't we? <laughs> oh, um, oh, that was fun. <laughs> what a great time last night everybody had. So um, 
I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I want to <laughs> acknowledge uh, our port team. Sony is in the back of the room. I know back there, Sony, you want to stand up and just, where are you? Right there. <laughs> uh, Rick Aizawa had to head back to Portland this morning for a family situation. And Walt Marshbanks was here yesterday from our operations team. Many of you work with, Malt, with Walt over the years. And obviously, Curtis and all the people of the port, <laughs> we want to thank you. We understand how important the tourism industry is to PDX. You bring millions of visitors into PDX um, each year, supporting our rental car programs, our concession program, our parking programs. And uh, I want to think, I want to make all of you <coughs> ambassadors. I have to catch my breath after <laughs> dancing with Lorna. <laughs> I'll be back in just a minute. Um, <laughs> um, we want to make all of you, I want you to think of yourselves as ambassadors for PDX because um, we need to make sure that everybody that flies into Oregon, especially internationally, is on a nonstop flight. If they're coming from the UK, they should be on the British Airways flight. If they're coming from Amsterdam, they should be on the Delta Airlines flight. Um, these are world-class airlines uh, that we featured over the last two days. Guillermo from BA was here yesterday, and Stephen was here Monday night from Delta. In great part because they are our lifeline to access to these global markets for passengers, cargo, tourism, business travel. So think of yourselves as ambassadors when you go home, coworkers, family, friends, neighbors, tell them if they're flying internationally to fly on the nonstops. <clears throat> you know, being here the last couple days, it reminds me that the industry is really made up of small business owners. It's really the backbone of the industry. And the passion that everybody has, the awards the other night that people received, it just reinforced that to me. And I met two people last night. I met uh, Scotty Jones from Leaping Lamb Farms. And I met um, Katie Earle in line getting my rose thing done last night from and she's with, uh, she's with uh, Onward Adventures in Astoria, a new business owner, ground transportation, tour guide. And both of them just exuded enthusiasm, passion for what really makes Oregon tourism great. Um, and the last person I, I want to acknowledge is, is Thelma from Slowpoke Tours in the back. She's been doing this for 38 years, <laughs> Thelma. She, she told me she, Ended a job at the phone company on a Friday, and Monday she started her company, Slowpoke Tours, and, uh, and she's still doing it today, and she's mentoring a, uh, a new co-worker with her there. So I just want to acknowledge them. I also, um, I want to acknowledge the commission. I know the commission is here over, aren't they? Mostly over here. <laughs> They're not all there, but um, um, I know how much you guys put into volunteering to be commissioners, and it was one of the thrills of my career to serve on the commission at one time. And I, I just want to mention a few names of people that I served with because I think it's important to remember who brought us to the dance, who was there in the early years when we didn't have any marketing budget. And Todd will talk later about um, when the bill passed uh, to give us more lodging money. But uh, some of the names that you might recognize, you might not. Um, uh, Amy Cuddy was my co-chair at the time. Jerry Frank, the iconic Jerry Frank, owner of that Conditorize. Steve Corey from Pendleton. Joe DeLisandra, who was the predecessor to Todd in his role. Katie Koba, she's now the chair of the Port Commission. Uh, Mary Arnstead, uh, Mary, everybody knows Mary. Libby Tower, David Tovey from the Native Tribes. Harold Poland, the iconic Harold Poland that really was the godfather of the lodging industry at one time. If you were anywhere near the lodging industry back in the 90s, uh, you, everybody knew Harold. Michael Justin ran Black Butte Ranch. Lori Van Zant to Tootin Lodge. Chuck Rouse from Eastern Oregon. Bob Brands from um, Sun River. And Marlene Krause was our, you know, really the person that really ran the commission for all of us, the late Marlene Krause, who we love, Marlene Krause, who we love dearly. So I just want to acknowledge uh, commissioners that came before us. How about a round of applause for those commissioners? <laughs> um, so PDX Next, as the terminal is opening, uh, it's, it's being delayed just a little bit. It's going to be late summer, early fall when it opens, but the, the additional wait's going to be worth it. We are so excited about what's coming and what you're going to be able to see. And at least it's in my ear. Can we host a reception somewhere at the airport next year? We'll, we will work on that with you with no commitments at this point. But uh, um, the challenge that the port 
Curtis and leadership came up with, with ZGFR, the architects of the new terminal, they wanted to make it local, they wanted to make it sustainable, so it was good for the, the future of, of Oregon. And so ZGF spent, literally spent time walking in the forests of Oregon and came back with an idea of a nine acre, sustainably harvested roof, uh, mass timber roof with big skylights in it to span the, this nine, uh, nine acres of, of our roof at PDX. It's, it's unlike anything you would see anywhere in the industry. Um, and we worked with local family farms, and I'm so proud of this, four local tribal nations have been involved in helping us build the roof, and uh, we'll be able to show you when you come into the new terminal where the wood comes from in, throughout the, the nine acres. So um, it's 50% more efficient from an energy standpoint. We have 22 new concessions coming in. They are all local brands. And over 50% are women and minority owned businesses. Again, we take great pride in things like that. <clears throat> and $200 million of contracts were awarded to local small businesses. We were adamant that we wanted small businesses to have a chance. To, generally, when you're doing big projects like that, is big contractors and big companies that end up building it. And we wanted to make sure, Curtis and the commission wanted to make sure that we engage with local businesses to, to do that. Um, and the result, when people get a sneak peek behind the curtain of the new terminal, some of you had a chance to do that, what they tell us, that they keep telling us, it reflects the best of us. And all of us at the port could not agree more. We are so excited about what's coming, and we think you all will be as well uh, later in the summer and the fall when you get to see it. Um, we're gonna give you a sneak peek here. Um, there's, every day there's over 900 workers in the, on the project, craftspeople, uh, local people doing great work. They're getting ready to plant 70 trees in the terminal. Uh, the carpet, the iconic carpet that many of you historically remember is being brought back in spots where you can sit and listen and relax. Um, and the recycle bags that you got the other night, that this was really Sonia's idea, um, the iconic carpet brand is on those bags. So if you still have it, take it home, and when you go to the grocery store, you'll be, be able to think of PDX. So, um, so let's um, stop here, and I'm gonna give you a sneak peek uh, with a video. Guys? Thank you very much. Thanks, Todd, and the entire staff putting on a great conference, Lisa and Matt, and everybody that's working, working really hard on this. And we really look forward to seeing all of you in Portland in 2025. Thank you. David, thank you, as always. Um, I want to drive home one of the points. David kind of passed over it uh, quickly, but it's an important distinction to make because we all travel, we all are in airports every year, and in many airports you see many of the same concessions. Am I right? Right? Over and over and over again you see the same concessions, whether you are in Houston or you're in Chicago or you're in JFK, wherever you may be, same concessions. And that's because there are a couple of companies that you can contract with and they will bring in all those brands and they'll set you up. So it's very efficient for an airport to have a couple of contracts that'll bring in, then those contractors will then bring in those firms and be able to set up all those concessions for you in your, in your terminals. David mentioned all the new concessionaires that are coming in and how they're all Oregon companies. Number one, that took an RFP process where they put it out to bid. They brought together a, a firm. They invited Travel Oregon to have a representative on that to make sure that they were, you know, representing that component, this, this industry that we love, was going to be part of that decision-making process. 
And then each and every one of those concessions resulted in an individual contract. So they're not managing one or two contracts to bring in all of the food vendors and such that you see. They're managing literally dozens to make sure that it feels like Oregon and that our guests, when they arrive and they depart from PDX, are feeling that Oregon love and that Oregon welcome and that Oregon farewell. David, we couldn't be more proud. We couldn't be more pleased and impressed with the work that you guys are doing. So thank you for that work. Kind of a bittersweet moment. David mentioned Marlene Krauss. When I came to work at Travel Oregon and became the, the tourism director in 96, Marlene was my executive assistant, my very first executive assistant. Really, she was my very first boss. And as David said, she ran the commission, okay? And if you knew Marlene, you love Marlene. I, I love Marlene, and I miss her dearly. Um, there were two things I could always count on on my birthday. And since you all got to be part of that, I don't mind reminiscing about it. Um, but there were always two things I could count on on my birthday, and that was a phone call from Marlene and a phone call from my mom. And with both of them passing, those are two phone calls I don't get anymore. So, so let me start by saying if your folks are still alive, call them and tell them you're grateful. And secondly, I just, you know, those are just, like I said, those are fond, fond memories. And David, I, I appreciate you um, bringing up and mentioning those, those members of the Tourism Commission that were there, you know, uh, back when our budget was $3 million a year for everything we do. And if you're not familiar with that, that meant we were 47th in the country out of 50 states. And I don't know about you, but the industry thought that was pretty doggone embarrassing. You know, we don't want to be 47th at anything, let alone in how we're funding our, our statewide tourism efforts. And that led to some exciting work, and I'm going to touch on that more in just a moment, but it does provide me a little bit of a segue to mention one more thing about David. Because you've heard me talk about, in the past, about the work that was done about 20 years ago to pass the Oregon Tourism Investment Proposal. David was not only a member of the Oregon Tourism Commission, David chaired the Oregon Tourism Commission. And he chaired the Oregon Tourism Commission at a time that we were working on that bill and moving it through the legislature. And I just want you to know that even though David was chair of the Oregon Tourism Commission, we still got the bill done. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You, you knew I wasn't going to let you off the hook that easily, buddy. Um, you still got, it, still got it done. But more, like I said, more on that in just a moment. Because I do want to touch on that th a third objective that's part of our 10-year strategic vision. As you know, I've gone through this conference giving you kind of these mini chats, kind of a little bit of a peek inside the work that we do with our 10-year strategic vision and talking about those four primary objectives, those four pillars that really hold up that vision. And the third one that I want to talk to you about today is that Oregon delivers, delivers remarkable experiences. Within this specific objective resides all the strategies that focus on identifying and developing and promoting experiences that make Oregon this place that we love. It makes Oregon this thriving place to visit and to live. These are strategies that bolster regenerative tourism business and product development in urban and rural areas alike and on tribal lands, making sure that we're providing visitors with immersive Oregon experiences. Now, you might be wondering why regenerative. You might also be wondering, what the heck is regenerative? Um, simply put, if you're not familiar with the term regenerative, and you heard a little bit about it from Danielle yesterday, thank you so much, Danielle, for your work in this space and for the work of WAVA in this space and for bringing us that primer in terms of a definition. For me, when I think about regenerative, what it means is we've got to move beyond the way we've always thought about sustainability or stewardship. Because for a long time, it's been about leaving it like you found it. And with all due respect, and I mean that sincerely, with great respect to organizations like Tread Lightly and Leave No Trace, I, I feel it only goes so far. The idea of regenerative is 
we as visitors can enter a landscape and leave it better than we found it. Not leave it the same, we can leave it actually better. Whether you're helping replant an area that had been devastated by a wildfire, or you're working in a riparian zone and helping repair and restore that area where land meets water to help improve salmon habitat, or you're frequenting those hyper-local makers and chefs and other producers so that you can really make sure you're driving home that local financial benefit. Now, these may not seem like great things to you, but I often think when I think about doing great things and whether something is or is not a great thing, I think about St. Mother Teresa, favorite quote, because she said, we may not all have the opportunity in our lives to do great things, but we can all do small things every day with great love. This sentiment is as true for us that work and serve in Oregon's tourism and hospitality industry. And it's why this strategy to make sure that we are developing and attracting and retaining our industry's workforce by advancing educational and career opportunities that are firmly embedded in this same goal. Because a remarkable workforce delivers remarkable Oregon experiences. These are the folks that have the business vision. These are the folks that take the risks. These are the folks that take out the business loan. They mortgage their home. They wait the tables. They transport us to our destination. They offer us a taste of their latest vintage. They clean our rooms. They infuse our ventures with stories and history, and they prepare our meals. Similarly, the work of Travel Oregon and the work that we do to really undertake as a destination management organization is rooted in our purest intention to be in service to the industry. And it's our desire to be as responsive as we possibly can to you and to what our stakeholders need. To develop a, strate a strategic vision which focuses on long-term successes and protecting our state's people and natural resources for the future is not something that we could ever do alone. The success of our industry relies on strong alliances, trusting relationships. And so to ensure that we can always be in lockstep with the industry that we serve, we knew that alignment with our stakeholders would be key to any success that we would manifest. This alignment within our industry was also key to the passage of the Oregon Tourism Investment Proposal that I mentioned earlier. My friends, that was nearly 20 years ago this year. The legislation that implemented the statewide lodging tax also put protections in place over the use of local lodging taxes, and it established the Tourism Commission as we know it today. And it was led by an advocacy coalition representing every single sector of our industry. And it was fueled by literally hundreds of businesses that came together to advocate for that bill with the governor, with the legislature back in 2003 in support of this endeavor. Key to this effort was a promise that we made. We made a promise to the governor and to the legislature that if this bill passed, the tourism investment proposal was projected to generate half a billion dollars in new visitor spending the next year. The bill passed, lodging tax goes into effect, local lodging taxes begin to be protected, the dollars are being received by Travel Oregon, the marketing, sales, and development programs are being enhanced. One year later, we're always measuring our economic impact. You know that about us. We're tracking it every single year. We have a chance to get the numbers. Economic impact of travel and tourism in the state of Oregon the next year went up by just a little more than a half a billion dollars. Promises made and promises kept. 
These economic benefits, my friends, expanded since 2005, after that, that bill went into full force and effect. At the time, in 2005, Oregon's share of all visitor spending in the United States was roughly 0.98%. Fast forward to 2018, which is the last year that we have the numbers that we're able to kind of do a, a Oregon to, to national comparison prior to COVID. Our market share had increased to roughly 1.19%. So that's a 0.21% shift in market share. Now, any of you that are in sales are kind of like, what the heck? 0.21% doesn't sound like a whole heck of a lot. You just passed this bill. Your budget went from 3 million to 9 million uh, with, the, with the passage of the bill. Today, as you know, if you attended the commission meeting, it's roughly $40 million a year now in terms of the, the statewide transient lodging tax. By the way, local lodging taxes have similarly increased from at the time, there was probably around 90 to 100 million. It's over $300 million today. So that 0.21% share sounds like, really? Well, every 0.1% is worth a billion dollars. So shifting 0.2% roughly to Oregon's share means that there is $2 billion being spent in Oregon today that would not be spent here. That's what we mean when we talk about growing share. Right? So $2 billion being spent in Oregon today and all the job creating prowess and power that comes with that is something that we should never take for granted and something we should recognize is part of this incredible bill that was worked on 20 years ago, making sure that, yeah, there was a dedicated stable funding source at the state level but as importantly, if perhaps not even more so, we made sure we protected that resource at the local level as well, dedicating those dollars to travel and tourism. To share some illustrations about how we are even stronger together as we're stewarding these very financial resources that we use to then aid in the developing and the enhancing of new and existing tourism experiences, please join me in welcoming Kate Baumgartner, the external and public affairs strategist with Travel Oregon. Kate, come on up. So for those of you I haven't had the pleasure to meet yet, my name's Kate Baumgartner. Like Todd said, I oversee our public and external affairs here at Travel Oregon. And I had the pleasure of joining this team just about a year ago last spring. And been passionate about travel for a long time, but this was my first formal introduction to the tourism industry. So as you can imagine, I had a lot to learn. Um, and important among those learnings was gaining an understanding not only of how tourism is structured and funded in Oregon, but understanding why it's structured and funded that way. And central to that conversation has been the tourism investment proposal. House Bill 2267, chapter and verse, thanks Todd, um, which is the bill that not only created the commission, but set forth the future of tourism structure in Oregon and at all levels across the state. So as we talked more about this critical piece of legislation and what it's meant for our industry as well as what it's meant for the state, we also talked about what it meant for the industry to be dedicated and united in the efforts to get it passed. And we realized that's a story that we've not consistently told. Then we took stock of the leaders who are in the trenches, in the Capitol and in their own communities, working to get this bill passed, some of whom you've already heard from this morning. And we knew that there was an opportunity in front of us now to capture that living history and hear from industry veterans about the why of how tourism is funded the way that it is in Oregon and what it took to accomplish that. But also hear about the so what, speaking to how these resources have allowed us to invest in the visitor experience and steward Oregon as the amazing destination that it is. Then we looked a little closer at our calendars and we realized that this winter marked the 20th anniversary of the tourism investment proposal. So this project came together as a living history that celebrates and educates what 20 years of investing in tourism has meant for Oregon 
It's now available on our industry YouTube page and soon will be posted to the Travel Oregon industry site as well. And our hope is that it will be a tool for all of you as you are having conversations in your own communities about the why and the so what of tourism funding. Take it away. 20 years of the tourism investment proposal. I can't even believe that I'm sitting here talking about this 20 years later. Celebrating the 20th anniversary of a tax is very interesting, especially since it's a tax the industry supported, which it's hard to argue with the success that we've had with it. So. In 2002 and 2003, the unemployment rate was really bad. The economy was struggling. The general fund was losing money. We needed to position Oregon as a competitive destination, not only nationally, but globally. There's really no one knew where Oregon was at that time. We were just north of California and just south of Washington, but people really didn't know where we were. The travel and tourism industry in Oregon, it was creating jobs, it was creating economic vitality, it was generating tax revenue. Local lodging taxes were being increased, but less and less of that money was being directed to support the travel and tourism industry. They were using what was a discretionary tax on a very specific kind of business to fill huge general fund gaps, broad services. We knew that it was an opportunity to align the statewide industry and develop relationships from the grassroots level to invest in Oregon's economy by investing in tourism. People say, why should we spend money on advertising tourism? They come here because of the natural beauty of the state, but yet we have many other activities that we could attract people to come here through our advertising. I was passionate about the bill because I saw it being a benefit for tourism and our state and our community. It would increase jobs and it would be beneficial for all. Governor Kulingoski had just been elected in November of 2002. People were saying, what are you going to do to get me a job? And so he was bringing together groups of folks to talk about what he could do to stimulate the economy. And one of those groups was the travel and tourism industry. I met with them and they were talking me into actually prioritizing the idea of the Oregon Tourism Investment Proposal that would really do three things. Implement a statewide lodging tax of 1%, put protections in place over the use of local lodging taxes, and the third component was establishing Travel Oregon as a semi-independent public agency. Ultimately, out of that meeting, my staff and I decided to put it in the governor's budget, which probably in the long run helped it a great deal. The industry was really unified in knowing what the end game was. Working together is always beneficial in this, they're working independent. The willingness of the lodging industry to say, we are going to tax our customers for the better good of Oregon's economic vitality was real leadership at a time that it was very necessary. It was one of the first bills introduced and one of the last bills passed, so that should tell you a little something about it. You know, you had to make some compromise, so the compromise out of it was 70% of the future lodging taxes, if they're raised at a local level, 70% of them had to go to tourism-related activities and 30% could go to general fund. The difference that the Oregon Tourism Investment Proposal has made has been remarkable. Since 2003, there have been over 500 million visits, equating to $192 billion in visitor spending. The economic impact of international flights into Oregon is probably $100 million each year for what, just one of those flights. We wouldn't have the number of international flights we have today without the lodging tax, and without the support of Travel Oregon. I think what I appreciate most about the passing of this bill is how it affects rural Oregon. Today, we generate hundreds of millions of dollars in Coos County because of the tourism. These last 20 years have shown it was a great decision. It has grown our economy at the state level and it has grown our economy at the local level. 
20 years later, that bill is relatively the same. A couple of things that have occurred to it have been things that have made it better. This has extended into significant grant programs. In the last five years alone, Travel Oregon has distributed more than $16.5 million in grant resources statewide. These are resources that have been absolutely vital to the regions and the local communities. It's just one of the great economic tools we have in this state. We need these resources protected. We need them reinvested so that we can approach the challenges of seasonality, so that we can draw visitors here during the winter months when our retail and restaurants and museums need those visitors. We want to ensure that local communities and elected officials can understand and embrace what investment in small Oregon communities can mean. There's always a conversation about the rural-urban divide and uh, the work that Travel Oregon has always done, it's borderless. I think the legacy in looking at it and what we've been able to do is to tell the true story about Oregon. We have two billion dollars being spent in Oregon today that wouldn't have been spent here otherwise. There is no price tag that you can put on the commitment that the tourism industry has to the stewardship of Oregon, the passion that the people of this industry have, and the future that we believe in with Travel Oregon and Oregon's tourism industry. Thanks everyone. And also want to give a big thanks to our friends at Allied Video who put together that beautiful video, the videos um, on the awards gala and doing all the great AV work for us this conference. They've done a great job. So thanks to them. All right, now I have the pleasure of passing it off to a dear Travel Oregon colleague, our director, or excuse me, our destination services director and oftentimes Travel Oregon's chief karaoke officer, Scott Bricker. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate. Hello and welcome, everyone. Good morning. My name is Scott Bricker. Some of you might know me as the world-renowned Oktoberfest Olympics yodeling judge. <laughs> and I want to actually say last night was the first time I've ever given a 10 in that competition. <laughs> but I also have a day job at Travel Oregon. And I serve as a director of destination services within the destination stewardship department. And I'm incredibly excited to be here with you this morning. And I hope you're excited too, because we have an amazing panel ahead of us. The theme of this year's conference is stewarding Oregon's future. And we're focusing this morning on remarkable experiences. I know many of you are hard at work in supporting your destinations in stewarding and developing great places for the community and in service of tourism. Move past. And this morning, we are gonna have an amazing program with four community leaders who are gonna be sharing their stories, providing inspirational and tactical strategies of how they accomplish their work. Each of these leaders will share a story about what they are doing in their journey in their local community, towards a community-based project or initiative. While they are special people, and their work to, and special ability to motivate, organize, and accomplish work has been amazing, and you will love these stories, their work is also scalable and repeatable. I ask for you to, as you soak in their stories, to consider what you might be able to bring back to your community from their experiences and their, and their learnings and their journey. After this morning's presentation, after our four speakers get up, we'll have a question and answer period. So I ask you to also jot down questions as the presentations are being delivered, as well, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. 
And then at the end of this morning's presentation, we will stay up here, or at the end of the session, we will stay up here. So you're welcome to come up and make a meaningful introduction with these folks so you can meet them, learn from them, and network. Now a little bit of housekeeping before we start. I ask you to take out your mini computers and flip phones and silence them because we want to make sure that these folks have your full attention. So please take a moment and do that now. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Misty Wharton is the superintendent of the Nestucca Valley School District. You will see Misty's passion for both children and her community and the health and well-being of both. Her story also exemplifies how giving back to the community can have a major impact on tourism and the connection between community development and tourism development. Please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Misty. All right, knock in bed. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's try. Uh, we can do better than that. That was kind of like senior in high school Monday government class. Good morning. All right, I'm looking for uh, kindergarten, just got done with recess, and it's Valentine's Day party. Good morning. Okay, ready? All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yep, that was great. So thank you very much. I'm excited to be here and share with you what I've been up to uh, in my community, and I'm also excited to share the, the stage with three other excellent stewards of their community that have done some amazing things. Um, I'm gonna throw a picture up here and I want you to try and find me up there on that screen. Which one of those is, is me? I'm not up there. <laughs> if I was, there'd be a big blonde Afro perm that you could still smell today with a headband, a Rambo t-shirt, and pink jelly sandals on. I was a bit of a dichotomy, but nobody messed with me. But on that picture that was up there, how many of you had a childhood where that was like your independence, freedom, and what you lived for every day? Like that was your childhood, right? Mine too. But mine looked a little bit more like this. <laughs> right? And to this day, I have a text message group on my phone that says Nastuka Goonies, which is all of my cousins because some of you are probably sitting there wondering where Nestucca Valley is. It's not actually a town. It's the name of a school district that is made up of 420 square miles of a bunch of little unincorporated towns on the Oregon coast. So we are in Tillamook County. We're the southern part of Tillamook County. And within that region, we have towns like Pacific City, which everyone knows because you can drink beer on the beach, which is a big deal, right? So we have Pacific City, we have Beaver, we have Hebo, we have Cloverdale, all those tiny little towns. And the school essentially is the heart of the community because it's the largest building in South Tillamook County. So it's used for everything. I'm a fifth generation uh, family on one side and a fourth generation family on the other. So my parents, my grandparents went through this school system. My daughters go through this school system. I'm firmly rooted in this community and I've seen the community shift in my lifetime from being dependent on agriculture as an industry to tourism and service as an industry. And right now we're in the middle of that shift and we're really welcoming and trying to encourage people to come to our region because we have so much to share. But with no formal government in that part of the region, the school gets to make some of those decisions on who we're inviting in and what we orchestrate. So the reason I find myself on this stage is Jen was at Cycle Oregon. We hosted Cycle Oregon uh, on our K-8 campus earlier this year. And with that came hundreds of people. They were crazy and asked me to talk, which I did, because I love to brag about my kids, and I find myself here. And so as superintendent, when I say that, people post-pandemic say, well, I'm really sorry. But I have the greatest job in the world, because my job is to go to work every day and advocate for kids, and to create opportunity and experiences for them that they can't create for themselves, which is what I've been working on the last eight years since I've been superintendent at that school district. 
What people don't understand, we have really beautiful facilities. They're all new. You're going to see a video here in a minute that showcases that. What they don't understand is three out of four of my kids in that school district have food insecurity. They're at the free or reduced poverty level. So we have all these beautiful vacation homes. We, you know, we have beautiful school facilities. We have kids that struggle with poverty. So I, being from that community, make it my number one goal to bring outstanding, literally world-class things to them so they feel like they have access to the greatest stuff in the world. And you'll, this video that we're about to show will do a much better job of, uh, of articulating that for you than me standing up here. But the premise of all of it is about relationships and knowing that every, anybody in this room could start with an idea and make something happen for their community. I would love nothing more than to have my bike gang bring my bicycles to your backyard and play in your bicycle park, and you bring yours to mine and play in my bicycle park that you're gonna see here, right? And it starts with conversations. And so I was on vacation in Hawaii, <clears throat> and we were at a park. Oh, I forget, there's a train, there we go. We were at a park, and uh, there was a school right next door, and this class, had a, a fleet of bicycles. They were in PE class learning how to ride a bicycle. And I need that. Because in South Tillamook County, if you've been there, there's nowhere to ride a bicycle. It's Highway 101, and it'd be like playing Froggart if you put a kid out there on Highway 101, right? And so I know that because when I wanted to go ride bikes with my friends, when I was a kid, my dad had to put my bike in the truck and drive me to their house, right? Because you can't be out on Highway 101. So I went to Hawaii, I saw these kids riding bicycles. I knew that kids in my school district did not have bicycles. Like that's a thing of the past. We lived for it, right? Because if you had to call your friend, your parents could hear everything because the phone's attached to the wall with a wire. Your freedom was get on a bike, go to my friend's house, I can be myself without my parents watching. So I come back from Hawaii, and there's a group called the Tillamook Off-Road Trail Alliance that has been around for a while, working to develop mountain bike trails in our region. And I reached out to them because one of their members, his name was Josh Venti, who I went to high school with. That's how things work in small towns, right? I said, Josh, I want bikes at my school. And he said, okay, let's do that. And so we started working on that and finding ways to develop a bike culture at Nestucca Valley, uh, Nestucca Valley School District. Um, and so here is a quote from Mr. Venti. So within nearly 27 acre campus, this is what we've been working on the last few years. I'll know when you guys are done because you'll get to the name of the landscaping company. <laughs> right? Yes, it's truly called Rose and Hose. If you met Josh, you'd understand. And you'll see him in this video that we're about to play here. This video is a prime example of how about having conversations with people who are energized about bringing opportunities to communities, good things happen. This was a donated video by NH Film, by Nathan Holstad, and it does a fantabulous job of, of really showcasing what our kids get to enjoy daily and what I invite you to come and try out yourself. The health and wellness of our community and the delicate balance of managing our natural area resources between conservation stewardship and recreation is an important concept to impart to all. As a community, we strive to create balance by providing outdoor recreation opportunities that allow us to champion the beautiful area we live in. It is important for the board of directors and our administrative team to create access for our students to experience as many opportunities as possible. These opportunities allow the development of character in being good stewards of their environment and for them to engage as active participants in their learning and creation of healthy habits that can last a lifetime. As a district, we have identified development of a bicycle skills park and pump track as an opportunity to educate students about the lifetime benefit of riding bicycles. We have implemented the All Kids Bike Program into our kindergarten curriculum that teaches our students bicycle safety and basics by then bringing to our school campus a place for students to safely ride their bikes, increasing their opportunity for a lifelong wellness activity. More importantly, by not limiting the use of the skills park to just the student body and inviting our community to use the park as well, 
we are creating a culture of active wellness in our part of the world. The beauty of riding a bicycle is that it's an activity that people can do at any age. Activities like this are great at being a community building energizer and equalizer. Regardless of age and type of bicycle, all people can be participants in the bicycle culture at the Nesteca K8. The skills park, the pump track, and the trail systems that will be developed in the future will serve our community for decades ahead. Families will now have a safe place to be active outdoors with a playground and skills park. Nesteca Valley School District is fully invested in creating and maintaining outdoor recreation areas that meet not just the students' needs, but the greater community as well. To this point, in the creation of the Skills Park, it has taken the commitment of multiple streams of funding and volunteering of time and materials. The collaborative work that has already occurred on this project has developed relationships that benefit the whole community and it is the intent of the district to continue to cast a net to a larger body of future collaborating donors and volunteers. There is no greater joy than seeing a child break out into a huge smile when they have finally learned a new skill. We are so fortunate to have the supporting community we do in order to create this wonderful opportunity for our kids. We are truly excited to see what the future holds for our community. So our entire community is very proud of that mountain bike skills course. And that's just the first, um, first item that we have on our agenda to create. We're eventually going to connect our two school districts together. One's on a hill, it's two miles away, and we'll do a mountain bike uh, trail to get the two schools. And then, you know, 10 years from now, I hope that you hear that crazy superintendent at the coast has expanded those trails from two miles inland at Cloverdale all the way to the beach so you can get there on a bicycle versus the road. Um, I think that... Thank you. We use bicycles as an educational vehicle in our school district. We have an alternative ed program that is a bicycle mechanics class. And so just the whole culture permeates, be active on your bicycle, but you can bring your bicycle. Good news, they make them with motors now. You need one. Um, and you can try out that mountain bike course. And if anyone in this room has the desire to build one, you just need some dirt some good-hearted individuals, and you need to reach out to me and other people that I know, and we will gladly share what we know and get you started on the process. Uh, the last slide I have for you, I think I adjusted it far enough ahead, did I not? Maybe, it said all kids bike on it, did that go up there? Okay, all kids bike is a great place to start. If you're sitting there and you're like, hey, how do we start a bike culture in my community? All kids Bi uh, bike is a nonprofit organization that's national. They will uh, set up a donor page for you and help you seek donations to buy a fleet of bicycles for kindergartners. It comes with a, a, a curriculum, um, adult bikes as well, helmets, the whole bit. And you, that's one way to engage your community in saying, hey, bicycles are gonna suddenly become important to us. We're gonna make that part of our school curriculum. And then you are energizing uh, people to ride bicycles and get that going. So check them out. Um, like I said, come talk to me. I love to meet new people and uh, I'll love to share everything that we've been working on. Thank you very much. All right, great job. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah, we're good. Thank you so much, Misty. Really appreciate it. I definitely want to be in your kindergarten class. I'm not sure about the branding class, but the kindergarten class for sure. Next, we have a fantastic leader, Shauna Noah O'Connor. Shauna is a dynamic leader in Portland serving Portland and beyond. Her special ability to organize people and events is on full display in the Ticket to Dine program, which is a gift to the people and the businesses of Portland. Please welcome Shauna. 
All right, knock them dead. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Shauna Noah O'Connor, and I'm with Ticket to Dine PDX. And I am so excited to be here with all of you this morning talking about big ideas that we can take back to our community. But I have a little something to admit, which is I'm not actually a big idea person. I work for the big idea people. People like Amanda Park with Prosper Portland on my People's Market, which is the largest BIPOC vendor market in the state. Or Michelle Comer with the Portland Winter Ice Rink that popped up in downtown. Or even the One Motorcycle Team, which brings in over 28,000 people from all over the country for a weekend of fun and motorcycles. I use my superpower for them, and my superpower is hurting all sorts of feral kittens. All the hundreds of humans that need to come together to get on the same page and make their big ideas come true. And one of those community visionaries that I got to work with was Travel Portland and their Portland Dining Month program, which is the origin story of Ticket to Dine. Travel Portland, ever heard of them? Yeah? Small outfit, right? So the Portland Dining Month program was a long-running and successful program where for $33, diners can enjoy a custom three-course meal. As the contracted program coordinator, I got to hear from all the restaurants, all the successes of the program, and also some of the challenges. One of which being that the low price point of the $33 really cut into their profit margins. And the other being that it was exclusive for fine dining, so it really didn't give other styles of service opportunities. But the successes outweighed the challenges, so we kept the party going for years. Until COVID hit. And I don't think I need to tell this group of people about how that impacted our local businesses. So Travel Portland had the insight that Portland Dining Month was no longer the type of service that our restaurants needed, and they were looking to pass the torch. So they asked businesses like mine to pitch new ideas and new iterations to help our restaurants that they could throw their support behind. And that's where Ticket to Dine was born. In coming up with a program, I wanted to hit a couple of goals. One, no discounts. We wanted to learn the lessons from Portland Dining Month, but when you add inflation and supply chain issues, we really wanted to make sure that as much money as possible was going in to help our restaurants. Two, operationally simple. With the pandemic pivot fatigue that they were experiencing, staffing issues, we wanted to make life easy on them. We wanted to make sure that they were just doing what they do and do it beautifully. Three, inclusive. Food carts and cafes were equally hit by the pandemic, and we wanted to make sure that we were supporting them as well. And then finally, make it fun. I don't know about y'all, but these past few years have been rough, am I right? Like, a little treat ain't cutting it anymore. Like, I need a treat on top of my treat nowadays. So, that is where Ticket to Dine was born. The concept is simple. We reward people for coming out and spending in our businesses and reward them with prizes. We provide the participating restaurants lotto-style tickets that they give out whenever anybody purchases anything. And that's it. That's all that they do. The diners then scan their tickets and see if they won a group of prizes. Things like concert tickets, sporting events, hotel nights, gift certificates. They get that little like treat on top of their treat, right? Um, and so we wanted to test our hypothesis. We did a pilot program last year. Just one week, only downtown restaurants with just a handful of big prizes. The feedback, the feedback that we got was Pretty good. The restaurant said it was easy, diners said it was fun, and we knew we were onto something. So March 1st of this year, we kicked it off and we went big. We now are going the entire month of March, expanded into the central city with nearly 100 participating restaurants and over 2,000 prizes. Additionally, we added a fun element where we asked the restaurants to contribute to the prize pool. What we wanted to do was create a ping pong effect. So if somebody wins at one location a prize from another, it might inspire them to go and, um, and experience something that maybe they haven't been to before. And I'm proud to say 
with this slide, it's going well. Uh, halfway through, it's going well, you guys. So we have, thank you. Thank you, it was hard work, thank you. So um, in addition to all the great press that our restaurants have been getting is I got a very excited email from one of our restaurants saying that somebody came in to redeem their one free soda that they won, brought in their whole family, ate a big meal, declared it their new favorite Thai restaurant, and, um, and they promised to be back. And this is why programs like these are so important. Um, the restaurant scene in Portland is the lifeblood of our city, right? It's a tent pole of our tourism. It's what we're known for internationally, and it brings our communities together. But restaurants can be a really brutal industry. At its best, it's long hours, hard work, and razor-thin profit margins. When you add on the pandemic, layer in things like the weather events, like the ice storm we had in January, or negative press, it can be a really grinding uphill battle. Programs like these create pathways for our communities to come in and celebrate these restaurants that not only give them the boost that they need financially, but also in morale. So the concept is simple. Reward people for coming out and spending at our establishments. Clearly, this is not something just for big cities like Portland. Every town has restaurants at home, and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say they could use a little love. Additionally, this is not something just for restaurants. This is the type of template that you can put onto many different styles of businesses. Portland is known for our food scene, but your community might be known for breweries, boutiques, or recreation, and you can apply this there. So, a couple of things to think about if you're gonna be doing this in your area. One, listen to your community first. Do not solve a problem you think that they have. Go out and hear about their actual problems. So, in addition to all the feedback from Portland Dining Month, we went out and did listening sessions with chefs and owners to hear about what they really needed so we can build goals around that and a program around that. Next up, the program is scalable based on your goals and resources. So the budget for nearly 100 restaurants in Portland might look different than, say, five breweries in Medford. Just note that a majority of your budget is going to go to advertising, but a majority of your time is going to be talking to all the businesses. Onboarding a new program takes a lot of time, and you want to consider that with your investment. And then finally, get a great team. So I mentioned to you earlier that my superpower was hurting all the kittens, but if you asked me to do any sort of graphic design, it would look ugly, brutally ugly. So that is why we have the amazing Erin Mae Davis. We also have Hannah doing social media and social media influencer management. We have Callie doing PR and Sarah doing our website and our backend ticketing system. Find people whose superpowers complement yours, but also complement the program. And that's actually my biggest takeaway of today. You don't have to be the big idea person. My homework to you today is to think of what your superpower is. Go back home and find teams that are doing things that are inspiring you and offer up your superpower to them. Because at the end of the day, big ideas are not the things that move the needle. It's you, it's your connections, your passion, and your hard work that's gonna make the biggest impact to your community. Thank you. Take that. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shauna. The ultimate cat lady. I didn't realize that maybe the key to hurting cats was the treat upon the treat. So next time you're trying to do that. I want to bring invite Kate Willis up to the stage next. Kate is simply full of passion. I have had a chance and the pleasure to meet Kate just more than a year ago, and I have personally seen that passion full throttle, bringing her ability to corral local and external stakeholders to support her community and move projects and make meaningful change happen at the local level. Please welcome Kate. All right, knock him dead, we got this. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
I am passionate. I'm like annoyingly passionate, I think. My t some folks that I, that I work with uh, are in the room, they know that for sure. Um, I'm so glad to be here and, and I'm really excited to share, um, to share what's, what's ahead of us. Um, I want to talk to you first about our work. I'm with South Wasco Alliance. It's an all-volunteer nonprofit. We have six board members, no staff. We have a really big agenda. So here's our work. And I want, I'm going to stay on this slide for a minute because there's some insights in here. It's kind of layered. I want to talk to you about what it is, and then I want to talk to you about how and who we do this, who we do this work with. Let's start at the end, the community development piece, because these things tie together. Community development, um, it's it, based on what we hear in our community. This includes food system development, health, community health, and housing in our area. Because if you think about it, if you're not addressing these basic needs, how can you get to workforce readiness? You have to address those needs. And in our community, um, there are a lot of folks who have these needs that let me, I'll, I'll tell you a story about in terms of community development. There's a really great article, I'm happy to share it with anyone after this uh, talk, that's, that I found really interesting. It's called Spiraling Up. And spiraling, if you, if you think about an economy in a spiraling down situation, in the late 80s and the 90s, um, early 90s in our community, uh, we had, you know, we're, we're a logging community, there were a variety of other factors, and I wasn't there at the, t at the time in the community at that time. Um, but the, the economy started to spiral down, and what I mean by that is the jobs went away, which means the schools then consolidated because the kids weren't, the kids were also going away. And then the community started to get stressed, and social connections also started to get stressed. That's why we really need to focus on this community development piece. And we're in the process of spiraling up. We're, we're rebuilding these things. So that's what I'm really here to share. Once, we, once you, those needs get met, then you can really focus on the workforce readiness piece. And with the work, workforce readiness piece, then you can start moving into that economic development. And I'm not saying that we're not, we're not doing all of these things. We are doing all of these things at the same time. Um, I also want to give you about the, the how and the who. So for instance, with the community development piece, we have so many partners, dozens of partners. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. Um, for instance, let's take community health as an example. We, um, we have just, we worked with our community to identify some of those needs. We have a collaborative at the local grassroots level of several organizations that are tied together and now we're working with county, regional, state, and federal level agencies to really work on that and we've secured money now for a community health worker. That's just one piece of the pie. For the workforce readiness piece, we now have a South Wasco business bridge. That includes our Maupin area chamber, the school, because we really want to be working with youth. And, um, uh, and, and South Wasco Alliance, um, I'm missing a partner. Uh, the, Maupin, the Maupin Works, which is funded by Business Oregon. It is a small business incubator on the main street in Maupin, which is in our territory. And uh, then that then ties into the community college, the Small Business Development Center, our, our Mid-Columbia Economic Development District, and other partners at that level. So you can see that vertical alignment from that local grassroots level. This is really powerful. For the economic development piece, and this is where it gets to travel Oregon and visit Central Oregon, critical for us. Because if you think about the zoning where we are, um, the land use laws, it's farm, it's ranching, it's forest, which is great for tourism because it leaves wide open spaces that are beautiful with amazing territory. But it also limits what we can do economically. So tourism is a really, really big thing for us. And we've had tremendous help from Travel Oregon and from Visit Central Oregon. Oops, sorry about that. I'm sorry about that too. I'm Trying to go back here. Okay, so where? Um, <clears throat> if you imagine um, the Columbia River Gorge and you're heading out to, to Cascade Lock, Hood River, and, and the Dells, um, and you imagine Bend on the other side of the Cascade, 
of the Cascades of Mount Hood, that's, that's where we are. So I'm, I just took this photo the other day, um, less than a week ago. I rolled down my window and I was like, this is just so amazingly beautiful. It was in, <laughs> this is the beloved Oregon that, cool, that uh, Governor Kulingowski was talking about on the first day. It is beloved Oregon. You cannot, you can't describe it. I'm looking west here, back to the ocean, back to Portland on the east side of the Cascades, right, at Mount Hood. And if you took a 360 and, and looked around from where I was standing, you'd see High Plateau. If you went to the right, you'd be heading north to um, up to the Columbia River Gorge. And you'd see on the way back, you'd see Mount Adams. You'd see Mount St. Helens. If you took a left on this road, you'd be driving down to Bend's Bend, and you'd be seeing that part of the Cascades and heading down that way. It's just stunningly beautiful. And it's also layered because we have such amazing geology here. We have we have amazing um, places for cycling. We've got the northern part of Warm Springs for the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute in, in South Wasco County. And we're also on the Barlow Road, which is part of the Oregon Trail. There's so much here, but this is undiscovered territory. So it's exciting for us to lean in on that economic development piece. OK, this is Gabe. I want to introduce you to Gabe, and Gabe sells eggs, at least at, at the time that this picture was taken, which was in 2020. He has zucchini in his arms that's about weighing him down, but he, he sold eggs. And he had a lot of help from his grandmother. He's nine years old in this picture. It was right in the very beginning of 2020 when COVID hit. There were eight families. This is the food system work that I was talking to you about, right? So leaning into that community, meeting the community needs and community development first. Um, these eight farming families didn't have big ranches, didn't have big farms, but they did have small production that they could do together. They got a booth in the Dalles at the farmer's market there. They had never done this before. They had dreamed about it for a long time. They got a booth. Two youth entrepreneurs came with him, that's including Gabe. And at, the, at first, he was very, very shy, as you could tell. But look at him now. Look at that. Look at his face there, nine years old. He is, he is loving it. And we'd be like, Gabe, go. You know? And he'd go greet the customers. And he developed such a great customer base that by the time that we, after two years, they got really good at retailing, we opened our own farmer's market in Thai Valley. And he was too busy having his own direct to, to customer to selling the eggs. He wasn't going to go to the farmer's market. He had too much to do with his own business. And he was 11. He was 11. It was amazing. So this is Gabe today. He's 14. And you can see he's gotten into some bigger stuff than eggs. His entire family is now moving in the direction of agritourism. Um, they have planted nut trees, fruit trees. They're getting into meat processing. For the first time um, in three years where South Wasco Alliance has been inviting them, like come down to the Oregon State University um, Small Farmers Conference. It's absolutely amazing, incredible. I think Audrey's in here. If you haven't gone there and you have an opportunity to take small farmers from your community there, phenomenal. It's in February. Um, so finally, uh, we had a group go with us this, this year, this last February, about a month ago, including some tribal members, which was awesome. And um, this, their, the, their family is doing so well. They're among uh, several of farmers now that are moving into agritourism in our area. So now economic development, moving into workforce readiness and economic development. It's really, it's really pretty fantastic. I also want to tell you about um, we didn't know we were doing this, but this happened in October, so five months ago. Our community didn't know we were doing a familiarization tour, but we were. We invited all of our partners through all of those different, um, for the community development piece of it, the workforce readiness piece of it, and the economic development piece of it. We invited them to our community. And you can see that there are, let's see, one, two, three, seven different sites here. We had to have two buses that were donated by the Imperial Hotel, which is out of Maupin. It was really, really nice of them. Uh, we just had to pay the insurance and the gas. They let us use two of their rafting um, buses. We filled them. We had like almost 50 people, uh, policymakers, um, agencies, USDA, Business Oregon, Travel Oregon, um, Visit Central Oregon. I can't even name them all. There were, there were 50 folks who came, filled up our buses, and this was an all-day event. 
um, from really busy people who came and gave up their entire day. We had to split up the tour. We couldn't visit all these sites in one thing. We broke it up and they had to pick an A tour and a B tour. And um, at the end of the day, we ended at, in Dufer at the Balch, which is in the Mount Hood Gorge RDMO, but we are in the Visit Central Oregon RDMO, so everything below Dufer is cent Visit Central Oregon. And um, it was, they were like, you did a fam tour. We were like, what? <laughs> so it was, it was great, we learned fam too. Now, now we're the fam team, and we are gonna be uh, leveraging a lot of different, um, a lot of different additional new economic development opportunities. Since then, as you heard two days ago, Antelope is getting, going for its dark sky certification. Uh, 22 is the scale for darkness. They're at a 21.68. They're really pretty darn dark in Antelope, in a good way. Um, they're also moving into accessibility with the help from Visit Central Oregon. They are going to be able to offer 10 cabins that are accessible, which is pretty great. Um, we are also, uh, we've applied to visit Central Oregon for a tribal market. Our tribal members in the northern part of Warm Springs are very excited to start a tribal market there and catch some people who are going to the newly reopening Canada in the area. And also outfitters that are going past there anyway to put, the, uh, to put, to put in on the, on the Deschutes River. We also, with uh, Travel Oregon, have had a feasibility study. Thank you, Travel Oregon, so much. Gravel and mountain cycling is really a possibility in our area, and uh, we're gonna be moving into that space. Oop. Graceful. <laughs> so, I wanna leave you with this. It's about the people. If you think about Gabe, and you think about an individual the potential of an individual is the potential of the family, is the potential of the community, is the potential of the state. These things are linked together, and so it isn't just about economic development, at least not in places like ours. It's about the whole system, the whole thing. I mean, Misty's right, she's talking about it. You're in un unincorporated areas, you gotta really, you gotta think differently and you gotta work with local organizations and work your way up. We have a lot of Gabes and families like Gabe's, and so this is a really big deal. It's also about the place, and I'm gonna pop up the potential. The place, um, we have an undiscovered place. I'm wondering what's undiscovered in your area. Thank you so much for letting me share my story. Thank you, Mike. Great job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. I just want to say you can't say no to Kate. Um, I've come to learn that, and I uh, appreciate her passion, the connections that she has in the community and that work. Final speaker is Bob Hackett. You've already seen Bob on stage here at the Governor's Conference, as well as in the video with the Governor's Award. I now have the pleasure to invite Bob on stage to share his story about organizing the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Sanctuary. Welcome up, Bob. Thank you. All right, go get him. Yep, yep. All right. Okay, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to switch it up a, a little bit, and I'm going to ask you to imagine it's nighttime and to imagine for a moment that uh, when you looked up at the sky last night, you could only see a few faint stars on the horizon. Uh, and that the Milky Way was nowhere in sight. And I know that some of you probably don't have to imagine that too hard. It's just the way the sky is where you live, and that's truly a shame. But there is something you can do about it. And so my name is Bob Hackett. I'm the executive director at Travel Southern Oregon, and I am here to talk to you about my five-year journey to preserve night sky through destination stewardship all in seven minutes. Um, the journey starts in, in Lake County, Oregon, and, and, and it's a place most Oregonians have never been. Honestly, a lot of folks haven't even imagined what, what, what Lake County's like. It's a great basin landscape of inland lakes and sheer fault escarpments of sage and wind and sun. It's a living home to millennia of people and antelope and bighorns and cattle and lots of cattle. Um, William Kittredge 
uh, of my former teacher at the University of Montana and one of Oregon's best writers, if you haven't read William Kittredge. He lived and worked on his family's ranch, the famous MC Ranch in Adel in the Warner Valley. And he writes, Southeastern Oregon and Northern Nevada is a drift of sagebrush country the size of France. And the raw land incessantly confronts us with geologic time and our own fragility. Mongolia has a population density five times greater than Lake County, which has one person per square mile. So it's not called the outback for nothing. This isn't the Pacific Northwest as we know most of Oregon to be. This is a country that's very much a part of the American West and that braided history of, of rugged individualism, co competition over finite resources, and the reliance on, on the cavalry and, and government leases and jobs just, just to make a living. And that question of who owns the West, not coincidentally a title of one of uh, Bill Kittredge's books, is still at the heart of much civil discourse and public policy in that vast range of wildland, which really challenges that notion of ownership every time I go out there. Remember when I mentioned that not being able to see the Milky Way? Well, if that's you, you're in good company with about 75% of the world's population who cannot see the Milky Way from, from where you live. The opposite is true in, in Lake County. The outback country of northern Nevada and southeastern Oregon is the largest contiguous pristine night uh, sky uh, area remaining in the United States. And it's an inheritance that most folks in Lake County recognize, but even by their own admission, they sometimes just take it for granted. They take this for granted. Just another perfect Milky Way night out in there, all the stars you've ever imagined, uh, textured with a cosmic dust that you can almost touch. In terms of stewardship, one of my favorite things about working in this industry, besides being with awesome women like this and, and, and work, being here with all of you, um, is the work that the DDEV team does at Travel Oregon uh, in the Rural Tourism Studio Program. And I saw Kristen out there earlier, so hi, Kristen. Um, I, and I like them because they're all about reality. They bring the people together in a community to talk about the real assets uh, to do a real lift with real action teams to help elevate a destination uh, and bring it into tourism space that works for that community. In January of 2018, we, we had a, a tourism studio in Lake County, and uh, we brought together 40 folks uh, up at the Warner Canyon Ski Hill. And I had been seeing, prior to that, articles uh, about uh, by Dark Sky International. It was the International Dark Sky Association then, and the work they'd been doing in the Colorado Basin and Utah um, with Dark Sky advocates to create Dark Sky places uh, and to protect and certify Dark Sky places. Uh, and Dark Sky had found a formula, which I, I'm not sure it was intentional, but an alliance with tourism agencies uh, and local businesses and public lands agencies um, to not only fight the rampant light pollution that is so quickly taking over so much, so much of the world, um, but to help create better places for all the things that live there. And I, I left the store, tourism studio believing that that conversation about outback pristine night skies was going to be one of our future conversations. What if, I thought, what, what if we could create a dark sky place in the Oregon outback? And, and if so, who, who would do it? Because the key to most dark sky place designations is the fact of a single landowner, a national park, a state park, where one entity can make a light management plan, change the lights, do the education outreach, and keep it nice and tight. There are no national parks or state parks out in the area we're talking about. It's a collection of agencies. So uh, as, let me just, yeah. And so as we in tourism talk more, like Todd talked about, about regenerative tourism, was there a way to create a new destination asset on a landscape scale that would not just leave the environment better than we found it, 
But could we offer visitors from across the world, that 75% of whom who cannot see the Milky Way, can we offer them a chance to have an up-close and personal experience with the cosmos just by walking out into the Oregon night? Fortunately, I wasn't the only person thinking about this. Uh, um, by chance, uh, Chelsea Peel at Playa Summer Lake, one of my favorite places in all of Oregon, an art and residency program in Summer Lake. They incorporate night sky programming into their writer residencies and, and their community outreach. She had reached out to me, and she'd also reached out to my colleague Don Nilsson, uh, whom I did this work with. And together, we got on a conference call around that table at the main lodge in Playa. And we talked about what if. That was the beginning of the what if conversation. And with more than Lake, 85% of Lake County is public land. It became really clear that a working collaborative was the only way to, to move forward uh, with county commissioners, ranchers, um, uh, you know, reaching out to the tribes, uh, and all the public and agencies, and private landowners as well. So it was in that spirit that the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Sanctuary um, uh, Network was born. It was born out of necessity. We needed this umbrella to come together underneath. And so in 2019, we began reaching out to managers of state and federal lands to start sharing the what if question. I hosted a spaghetti lunch presentation at the Heart Mountain store, uh, which is open. It always looks like that, but it's always open. Um, uh, and, and a whole bunch of school kids, all the school kids from the Plush and Adel Elementary Schools came, and we had spaghetti dinner, and their parents were there, and people from the Heart Mountain uh, National uh, you know, Antelope Refuge came down. And just, we talked about what if, and did my little presentation. Uh, but I would be absolutely lying if I said that the idea of creating a dark sky place in the outback was an immediate hit, because it most certainly wasn't. Um, and I understood why. Um, concerns about uh, how something like this would impact grazing leases, how would it affect road safety, what would it mean for a land manager to engage in an interagency light management plan that might have ripples in, in their own agency that they just could not possibly foresee. The pandemic uh, proved to be uh, a, a good time for us and made it easier to gather folks on Zoom. So we created the Dark Sky Network, large uh, meetings from all kinds of people on Zoom, and we were able to splinter off a much smaller steering committee of, of, of land managers who managed land that would be in any potential Dark Sky uh, place boundary. And so uh, while there continued to be you know, concerns and massive edits to everything as we went along. Every time Don and I asked the question, should we keep going? They're like, keep going. Keep going. So we kept going. And uh, in that effort to preserve and celebrate these pristine night skies of the Oregon Outback, I think we answered Bill Kittredge's original question of who owned the West. And uh, the simple answer is we all do. But, but that's kind of an entitled answer because there are people who actually really do own land out there and work really hard every day to keep it that way. But the work of our engaged local legislators and public land managers and dark sky advocates demonstrated clearly that it was absolutely pointless to, to um, compete over a limitless resource like the night sky. And when together we work to preserve that starry western night sky legacy and celebrate that rural way of life that has helped conserve that resource, we did that amazing thing in so many rural communities, and you all know what that is, we embraced change. We owned a change in the way we see and the way we collaborate to ensure that those dazzling night skies never change. And we created the Oregon Outback International Dark Sky Sanctuary, which, by the way, is the largest dark sky sanctuary in the world, and it was certified on Monday. I think it's a legacy that all Oregonians should be really proud of. We invite all of you to come down and see us, and um, I'm just so thankful to share that with you, and uh, thank you for being here this morning. Great work.
Well, thank you, panel. Really appreciate it. I have so many questions, but we've run out of time. So I'm sorry about not being able to deliver on that promise. So a few, uh, a few things before we wrap up. Just a couple notes from my standpoint of listening to these four amazing people. Have a strong vision and develop a strong why. Form a dedicated team and start, have that be yourself to help start. Find four acres of land and $60,000 and you can build a mountain bike park yourself. And know that great things can happen if you keep on leaning in. So I want to say from a Travel Oregon standpoint, we are here in a destination stewardship department as a destination stewardship organization to help you along the way. But I know whether it's your regional organizations, your local organizations, as tourism stakeholders, we can help communities achieve these amazing accomplishments. Lastly, I just want to say uh, thank you to TEDx Portland who helped coach us as speakers and presenters and MCs. Thank you. Um, and TEDx actually has uh, their annual event on April 27th at the Keller Auditorium in Portland, the most inspiring educational day of the year in Portland. So you can find out the details at tedxportland.com if you want tickets. So with that, I'm going to bring up Matt Finn. But before Matt comes, maybe while he is, maybe everyone can give one more hand to these amazing speakers. And we will be up here if you want to come up and chat with us afterwards. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. All right, I need to get on with that TEDx uh, speaker training so I don't have to come up with notes. We are at 9.57, so thank you so much, presenters. Really appreciate everything you've done uh, this morning and the preparation work. Uh, Scott, if you can bring up those slides for our breakout sessions. We are asking you to go directly to your breakout sessions that are starting very soon after 10 o'clock. Um, so you have some few choices there. There will be a break after that, and then those breakout sessions again at 12 p.m. So. Make sure you make your decision of where you're going. Um, please ask anyone if you need directions to find that. Um, I know these speakers will be available a little bit longer if you do have questions for them. One pitch for the closing session, and I do need to say I know we have a later lunch than normal. There will be snacks at that 11.20, 11.30 exhibitor break. Um, so we hope you grab a snack. Go to that breakout session at 12, and then join us back for lunch here, I believe, at 1.30. You will not want to miss Patagonia. Please be here. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Enjoy your sessions. Thank you.